Good morning. This is Woodblock Printmaker Dave Bull here again at my carving bench right inside the front door of our shop in Asakusa, Tokyo. It's a Tuesday here in Tokyo, our weekly closing day. Actually, it's a very windy Tuesday. You might hear the shutter banking as we're doing this. I can't help that. And because it's a closing day, that gives me a real chance to spend some time working on the next of our video presentations. The regular viewers know already what this one is going to be about. It's the second in a pair of videos that attempt to answer a question I'm asked by fans and visitors these days on a daily basis. How did you get started with woodblock printmaking? That first video a couple of weeks ago described my initial encounter with Japanese prints in a small gallery in Toronto back in the 1970s and looked at a few of my very rough first attempts to make my own. I then went on to tell how I saw a sort of spectacular woodblock prints while on a visit to Japan and I talked about how I received inspiration and encouragement from the publisher and the designer of those prints over the following few years. Now what we're going to do in today's ramble is revisit that same time period but with a focus on a different publisher, a man who also had a very strong impact on my development, Mr. Isamu Adachi, the person who operates the Adachi Publishing House here in Tokyo. His prints, his publications, and a couple of his craftsmen have had and are still having a great effect on me even to this day. But let's do this properly now. Let's roll back now, back to the point where I've seen Japanese prints in Toronto, as we explained in the other video. I've moved to Vancouver and begun living with a Japanese woman, and I've made a couple of rudimentary prints. We looked at them in that previous video. They're terrible in execution, but not so terrible that they put me off printmaking. I hadn't been to Japan yet at that point, and I was casting around for any information, any information on the world of Japanese woodblock prints. Now, those first reproductions, a couple were sort of originals, but a couple were, you know, reproductions of traditional Japanese woodblock prints. Now, I didn't own any at this time, so there's no way. I must have been to the library to find some pictures and, uh, you know, copied something from one of the books there. And I guess there was some kind of interlibrary information system where one library knew what was in another library, and I learned that there were two sets of actual woodblock prints from Japan in the library at the UBC Asian Studies Center. This is back in the 1970s, this name. So I heard about this, I got over there right away, and it turned out that you don't have to be a member, you didn't have to be a student. They let me in, go through the card catalog, talk to the lady, put the request in, and she brings back to the counter, bang, these two boxes that contain sets of Japanese prints. I get to the table, you know, don't need white gloves, or anything, get to the table, open them up, look at this, and it was a huge disappointment, actually, because they were hugely, terribly, awfully foxed and moldy. They really hadn't been cared for very well. They'd been shut up without being opened in terrible packing paper. Adachi really didn't do a good job on that. And they were basically destroyed. But whatever, I wasn't here to buy them or collect them. I was here to learn what I could. I'm looking at the lines, looking at the colors, looking at the back, trying to figure out what I can make. So I gleaned in what information I could from that. What I also gleaned from that was the name and address. You know, who is this? This is the Adachi Hunger in Kinkyu, whatever it was, and I wrote the address down and made a note of it ready for the first trip to Japan, which I described about in that previous video. We traveled around Japan here and there, saw those prints on display in a department store, and came back to Tokyo to buy them. And I think I made a bit of a mistake in that previous video. I told you these were the first prints I ever bought, those four prints of the Genji Monogatari that I showed you. My travel diary, which I have here from those days, shows that that's not true. The day before buying those prints, I visited the Adachi Publishing Place. I didn't have any introduction to them, but whatever, I just had that address. We looked it up and went over there, and, and my wife and I, she did the Japanese speaking, of course. I couldn't uh, handle anything at all. And I do have memory that we had a bit of, you know, they brought us in, gave us some tea, chatted with them. I must have told them the same story I told Saiki-san the next day over at the, at the Yuido company. I'm going to try making woodblock prints. And again, he didn't laugh, didn't, you know, whatever, gave me some advice, this and that, this and that. The conversation was a bit frustrating because my Japanese is like this level. His English is zero. So I would ask her a question. She puts it into Japanese, asked him. And he explains, explains, blah, 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 gestures, explains, blah, 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 blah. I'm sitting there and like, it's going on one minute, two minutes, three minutes, and it's fun. He stops and she says, he said it was done like this. Like in one phrase or whatever. And I'm, that's not what he said, but what are you going to do? Well, whatever. Get busy, Dave, and learn some Japanese. Anyway, anyway, anyway. 
I don't remember all the details of the conversation. I do know we bought a couple of woodblock prints because I have them still right here in my hot little hands. I've been taking care of them all these years. Again, we'll do this with the side camera. One was a reproduction that they're really famous for, uh, Sharak prints. They have a complete catalog. They've done reproductions of everything Sharak ever made and quite nice uh, reproductions they are too. And then I bought the second one, which is an almost unknown designer. And I can't remember why it caught my eye. Something about it. Maybe he just put a bunch on the table and this one caught my eye. It's a, a contemporary with tomatoes and the guy's name is Choki. And I liked it. I just liked it. I liked it. I liked it. And we bought these two. I remember the price. Well, I don't remember. It's in my diary. 8,000 yen each, which I guess uh, a bit high then, but a bargain seen from where we are now. I bought these two and we prepared to leave. We said our goodbyes. We got to, to the Genkan, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the entrance way of, of a Japanese building there. And what happened next kind of stunned me then and still stuns me now. He reached up above my head as we're putting our shoes on to a shelf there and he pulls down a piece of wood, a wood block. And as you've heard the story last month, Saiki-san gave me all kinds of stuff. Adachi-san gave me a brand new, clean, beautiful, freshly dressed wood block ready for carving. Why did he do that? I have no idea. I was just this guy who showed up. I'm going to be a printmaker, you know, whatever. Whatever. It's really interesting that my whole fear before I came to Japan, the situation would be closed, shut, secret. If you can't find anything, no way. Everybody I met, almost everybody I met, was open and friendly and supportive, giving me stuff, you know. Anyway, we'll meet that block in a few minutes. Okay, I'm getting too long here. Uh, the third visit I made, and my diary shows it was the very next day, we went to a place called Bumpodo, which actually is a stationery shop slash art supply shop. And I bought a couple of tools. And this must have been on a recommendation for Mr. Adachi. The address is right there in my, in my notebook. The shutter really is noisy. Actually, there's a typhoon approaching this evening. I hope we'll, we'll be okay here. The tools. I've still got two of the tools I bought that afternoon, although I've got to qualify what I say here. The handle that you're seeing is the same tool that I bought. The blade itself, this is, my God, 30x years ago, 40 years ago, has been sharpened and used and sharpened and used. The blades have been replaced a couple of times. But that's the way these Japanese tools work. The blades and the handles are different things. The, 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 here, I'll do this with a side camera here. If I don't cut myself, the thing comes apart it opens up. There's a blade inside which comes forward bit by bit by bit. And this one actually is now coming to the end. It would have been about that long originally. I've got no idea how many times this has been replaced in the intervening years. But there they are. Two of the prints I bought on that first trip to Japan. Two of the tools I bought on that first trip to Japan. Still being used. Okay, you've seen the rest of the story. We're back in Canada. I'm working on reproductions now, working on reproductions, getting better. I've got a real piece of wood. I've got some real tools. I've got those Okada prints as samples. I've just, you know, whatever. The back burners are lit and I'm, I'm up and running. It's still no good, but I'm up and running. The first print I made, I got these ready. The first print I made on that piece of wood, I don't really know who the designer is here. It might be Kiyomasu, Kiyonobu, I'm not really sure. It's one of the early days of ukiyo-e, before they had finished uh, uh, color, before they had developed color printing. I tried making some simple color blocks. And it's, it's okay. The, the lines are fat and, what's the word, fudgy, pudgy? They're not elegant at all. There's a couple of places that are, that are broken off here. But look at this, the calligraphy, it's readable. It looks kind of nice. I think we're moving along. I finished that one, hunted around at the library or something for something else. And on the back side of that same block, oops, got upside down here, tried something that was quite a bit more difficult, quite a bit more delicate. And Dave here is really sort of actually moving along here now. The fudgy, fat, pudgy lines are slimming down, getting more elegant, getting a bit more uh, not loose, Whatever, things are coming together. I'm learning how to do this bit by bit. Now, as I described in that, uh, in that other video, I made a second visit to Japan after this. I was really getting on fire with this. And the second visit to Japan wasn't just to Japan. We had a baby by this time, Himi-chan. She was born in April. So come November, we decided to take Himi-chan and go on shore to the Japanese grandparents and the British grandparents, which meant she went on my back in a carrier. We bought ourselves round-the-world tickets 
and Himichan at nine months old made her first circumnavigation of this planet. We had a fabulous time. I don't know if they still sell those tickets, round the world tickets. It's an open ticket. You can use it anytime in one year with one proviso. You take a trip to there and you can't come backwards. You've got to keep moving west or west or west or east, 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 whichever way you started. It used a number of different airline companies tied together. We didn't take a year, we took about three months and had a great time. Canada to Japan for the Japanese trip. We went to Hong Kong, New Delhi, uh, Germany, England, back to Canada. Wonderful, wonderful time. But anyway, the point of this story, while we were in Japan, for just a few weeks we were in Japan that time, I went to see a Dachshund again. I must have taken, I don't really remember, but I must have taken the two prints I made, knocked on the door, in for tea, show this, chat, 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 chat. And actually I know what day it is because in my travel diary, it's right there. It says January the 10th, train, we're living at her sister's place for the, for the time we're staying in Japan. It says train to Mejiro, which is where the Adachi workshop is. It's January the 10th. And I knocked on the door eagerly, eagerly. He brought me in and he remembered me or not. I don't remember whatever. I show the prince. He must have remembered me at that point. And I say, is it possible, my broken Japanese, is it possible maybe I can see perhaps a little bit of how the craftsmen are working here? And I do know, because I'll talk to him later about this, I do know that he grumbled. No, look, we're busy. We're preparing for a big Sharak exhibition and this and this and this is going on. Yeah, whatever, okay. Tell you what, let's go upstairs. But don't bother these guys. And he put me in a little room with one young carver who had just started that week, it turns out. His name was Horimoto-san. He became a friend of mine later on. And Horimoto-san is just working on some little training stuff. Cut circles, cut leaves, cut this, cut that. And all of a sudden, bang, there's this foreigner who doesn't speak Japanese sitting next to him. And I'm like, I won't bother you, do whatever. So, and my notebook, the other side of this notebook, is full, full of real cool, it's sketches. Look, how you cut a leaf, you make stroke one, stroke two, stroke threes at the bottom. Then you do this for a round leaf, it's a bit different. There's memos on this and that, how the flask sits in front of the guy. I just sat there gleaning everything I could, bit by bit, watching, watching, watching. He maybe tried to explain a little bit. I was trying not to bother him. One hour, hour and a half, two hours go by. I had a ton of fun. It was a, you know, you're like a vacuum cleaner trying to suck this stuff up as much as you can, knowing that when I get home, oh my God, why didn't I look at such and such a thing? You know, trying to remember it all as you go along. Anyway, there it was. At that time, I must have come upstairs and said, what do you think, guy? Enough, okay, where you go? Hi, go home, bang, bang, bang. Downstairs we go, I say my thank yous, out I go. Back home, try and digest this. I must have even refreshed some of my notes. Back to the travel part of the diary, that was January 10th. Turning the page to January 11th, I see here it says train to Mejiro. And I know, I went back the next day, knocked on the door again, bang, bang, bang. He opens it, you know, you again? And I guess I must have said, that was you know, wonderful. I, I learned so much and thank you very much. And, but what about maybe the printer's side or something? I don't remember what I said. <laughs> and he must have said, we're busy. I told you, we're preparing for an exhibition. Look, you chatted with that young boy yesterday. These printers are busy. They can't talk. Let's go upstairs. You sit in the corner and don't you dare disturb them and whatever. And they didn't care anyway. I'm sitting in the corner and these guys are just there, just working, making prints. They could care less somebody was there in the corner watching them. No discussion, no conversations, no nothing. And again in the notebook, it's how he was holding the Baron strong, tight, and how much water is in there? Can I see how much pressure? You know, I'm just, again, trying to glean everything I can from this. A Dutch son comes up. It was maybe just like 20, 30 minutes. I don't even know. That's good. Okay, good. Hi, where you go? Good. You're good. I'm good. We're done. Looking at the diary, January 10th, January 11th, visit to Mejiro. January 12th, it's there. Train to Mejiro. I went back a third time. My God, I must have had brass balls. I have no idea. I can't believe I actually did such a thing. I went back the third time. I knock on the door. I open it. It's a volcano. The guy just explodes. His face goes red. He starts. He pulls me in, gestures to the telephone. Your wife, get her. Get your wife on the phone. Whatever. I look up their number in the book and he picks it up and he just, whatever. He's not a bad man, but he, I can't say he abused her. Whatever. He let her know the score. Gah, 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 gah. After a minute of this, he just gives me the phone. And you know what this is. She just says, get out of there as fast as you can. Bow down to the floor as fast as you can. Just get out and don't ever show your door face on that door again. I go out, I go out. He didn't like slam the door or anything, but that was it. Bang. I'm there on the doorstep. Okay. I go home and whatever, whatever, whatever. A few days go on and we leave Japan for, for Hong Kong and away we go. We're out and away it goes. So much for me 
and the Adachi Hunger Company. Oh, actually, sorry, I forgot. Before we went to Hong Kong, actually, we did. We went to the Block Planer, and he, Adachi-san, had given me the address of the Block Planer during the first day's conversation. This was Shimano-san, who would turn out to be the man who would supply me with wood blocks for decades, all through the Long Hundred Poets series. I've got a receipt, you know, that, that little notebook we have this day. I've got a receipt here from Shimano-san. It seems that on the 25th of there, I was in Adachi 10, 11, or 12. On the 25th, I was at the block planner. She must have phoned in advance, actually, to put the order in, and I went in to pay it. And they were cheap, 8,800 yen for beautiful Oban blocks, and there's six of them. We'll meet those blocks again, not in this story, but in one of the next stories coming up. We'll meet them again. I also put in an order for a large wood block, for a, a large special print, about a scroll size print, and we were going to have those shipped back to Canada to us. He delivered them to her sister's place, who shipped them back to our home in Canada. We couldn't take wood blocks through the rest of our travels. Anyway, there it is. That trip to Japan was over. We visited Shimano we ordered blocks around the world, visit Grandma back home in Vancouver, and Dave is now just you know, I told you in the first video, I'm doing the craft shows, I'm trying to do this, I'm practicing, getting better. I took that on a large woodblock once it arrived, got to the library, got some kind of image of a print, and I cut what I thought was an absolutely spectacular, spectacular image. It's from the Kai Getsudo group, a famous group of artists that worked in the very earliest days of woodblock printmaking. And it was a print that was made in its original form before color printing had been invented. And I hacked away at that wood block, and I can see, you know, I, don't, I didn't bring the wood block today, it was too heavy, but I can see looking at it now, all these wide areas. I didn't have the big wide chisels that I have now. I had little scoop scoop. In fact, this one, this one, that, that six millimeter chisel I bought, that was the chisel that cleared out all the background around this thing. I was nuts, I just didn't know what I was doing, but I was up and running. Anyway, we've told about this before, like I did craft shows, craft shows, how can I do this, how can I sell prints? We ended up saving up some money, quitting my job at the music store, making a plan for how we could go to Japan and make a living at this. And I convinced my wife to go for it with me. And where we ended that last video two weeks ago, we were there. there. The little young family, we were walking towards the immigration counter at Narita. Dave with no visa. He had applied for a cultural visa, rejected, applied for a student visa, rejected. I had no idea what was going to happen walking towards the immigration counter. Would I get turned away? What were we going to do? So, as I said, we approached the immigration counter. I had to stop the video there because this camera won't do more than 30 minutes at a time. So, sorry for the little break there. Anyway, let's get on with this. The guy looks at us, the four of us. Are you, are you a family? Are you, this is my wife, these are my kids. I'm on a Canadian passport. She's on a Japanese passport. She's got the kids on her passport. All set to go. In we go. And he says, uh, are you married? And we said, well, sure, we're a family. These are my kids. He said, no, 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 no. I mean, are you actually, like, married? Do you have some paperwork you can show me? And what it turned out was that we were thinking of ourselves as a family, as a, as a, as a partners and whatever. But that's not good enough for the Japanese immigration system. I had to come in. He gave me a stamp in the passport. I had to come in as a tourist with a three-month, bang, admitted stamp. And she came in, of course, as a Japanese national, as did the kids. But... He told us, look, if you guys are married, then that's it. There is a classification for spouses of Japanese nationals. You can come and be in Japan. I'm like, you mean like I can live here? He said, yes, of course, you can live here. I said, like, what about working? He said, you can live here and you can work if you're the spouse of a Japanese national. In you come. Go get married. So there we are. We did. Two or three days later, we were at the city hall where her, her sister's house was. We got ourselves married, and I was back to the immigration office later on to get an update, get another three months and another six months, and away and away and away we went. And there we were. We were living in Japan, ready to start that plan that I had cooked up back in Canada. Now, before we did that, before we actually rented an apartment and stuff, we took the summer vacation off. We went to her dad's place. He lived way out in the, in the farm in the summer. And we spent uh, July and August living out there. And I actually, I made a woodblock print while I was out there. I had taken some woodblocks with me. 
And look at this. It's one of my first original woodblock prints. <laughs> kind of, whatever. It's very simple. And it's a paste, a cut and paste job of a bunch of different things. It's a head that I saw from some kimono magazine. A bit of kimono I saw from some magazine. The back was from a local copy of Playboy or something. I don't remember. I just cut some pieces together. Remember, I wasn't and still aren't an artist, but I wanted to cut and print and cut and print. But I did it over that July. I got to say, it's a nice piece of wood. You've got wood grain here beautifully. They came up not quite so bad. Okay, we pack our gear up. We finish the summer holiday. Back we go to, 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 uh, to Tokyo. And we find a place to live. The first place I wanted to live was Asakusa. I wanted to go and, and live there. But I went to a real estate office in Asakusa. And my God, this was the end of the bubble time. And impossible. I don't remember the exact number. Two, three thousand dollars a month for rent. Impossible. So bit by bit by bit, I went farther out, farther out, farther out, trying to find a place where the rent was cheap enough for us to afford. And we ended up living in a place called Hamuramachi, out on the west side of Tokyo. And as I said, the plan that we had outlined back while in Canada, it basically worked. We set up an English school. I could teach kids. That was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Later it expanded to Saturday. Uh, she was doing translations. I was helping her do that. I was teaching English. And I was practicing printmaking on the side. And that fall, it must have been in October, I went and registered at the Yoshida Hanga Academy. You may have heard the word Yoshida in the world of printmaking. This is being run at the moment by, at that time, by Toshi Yoshida, who was alive. It's the three generations. Then Hiroshi Yoshida was dead by then. Toshi Yoshida was running the Hanga Academy. And his son Tsukasa-san is still now there taking care of the place. And I was there as a student. Now, it wasn't an actual school curriculum, step one, do this, step two, do this, here's the class. It was just an open workshop. Yoshida printers were there working on the Yoshida blocks. We were allowed to watch in the next room and see what they're doing. We each had a bench space, and you basically learned from the other students who, who were nearby you, who had been there, you know, a day or a month or a year longer than you. And over the next couple of months there, I made two prints there. I either cut and printed on plywood, because that's the material that the Yoshida studio uses for their uh, color blocks. And the key blocks, this is the reason why I quit the place. They don't have a carver there. They don't use key blocks for the line drawings. Toshi Sensei drew them. They photographed it at a printing company and sent it back with a metal plate. Their prints are, for the most part, made with metal plates. And when I saw this, I'm like, oh, geez, this is not why I'm here. I'm in Japan to learn how to carve. So I. I left the place. I'm not in any hostel. They're good people. They're really cool. It would have made more sense for me to sit there and learn more about printing, but I was just, this is not the place for me. So I went home back to working by myself. Pretty much the same as I had done in Canada. Practicing, 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 but now with much better tools, now with much better access to nice pieces of wood. The problem came was the life that surrounded us. The English school took up a huge amount of time and energy. I didn't use a textbook. I built my own curriculum. The translations that my wife were doing, we got in real trouble. I think I might have talked about it in the previous video. The translation company sent it over by fax, got to be done tonight. And what they were expecting was to get stage one translations. A Japanese person translates into rough English, sends it back. The translation company then sends it out to a native speaker for reworking into perfect English. I, of course, reworked her stuff and we sent it back in perfect form. And the companies got onto this. They thought, oh my God, just for the cost of, of her first level work, they got double level work. So the work just poured every day. The fax machine was just spitting out stuff, spitting out, spitting out stuff. We kind of got really heavily stressed about this because it was just too much work. I wasn't getting any chance to practice prints. On top of this, too, we started making wooden toys. I brought some pictures here. What had happened was when we had moved into the apartment, we had nothing. The kids had each come like with one little, little toy by themselves. So I had made some simple wooden toys for them. The neighbors, women said, oh my God, that's so interesting. Can I have one? Can I have one? And we ended up starting the Woody Friend Toy Company and we made all kinds of stuff. Let me try and show you some pictures here. Look at this. Here we are. There's a bunch of easels. I made stuff a group at a time. That's got a blackboard on one side and a whiteboard on the other side. Here's, uh, here we are, look at this. The kids are playing with some of our two-layer puzzles. You open the front door and there's animals hidden inside. There were letter puzzles. There were character puzzles. There we are, we're making a bunch of the, uh, a saw. I made a jigsaw actually to use to make some of these toys. There we are. There's one of our assistants. She's a sales lady who was working for us selling these things. She's wrapping up one of the cube puzzles that we made. There's one of our character puzzles. It just went on and on and on. It, look at this, snake puzzles. 
We made alphabet snakes, A, B, C snakes, and then I've got one here. I've still got a few of those old toys left. I don't have space here to do it around. Maybe I'll, I'll get a B-roll later, show you on the floor. It's a snake shape with letters, and you put them together in the shape of the Japanese alphabet here, I, Ro, Ha, Ni, Ho, He, To, and by the time you've built the snake, going by all the, all the shape combinations, you've learned your alphabet. They were hugely popular. It exploded, and just, I, what am I going to do? I'm here to try and make prints. We're translators, we're English teachers, we're doing everything except make woodblock prints. I had a sort of a day of reckoning with myself. This is 1988. We've been here two years. It's 1988 in autumn and we may have had a fight. She and I, I don't even remember. There was stress, stress, stress. I sat down, decided, what am I going to do with my life? What do I want to do? I can't quit English teaching. I've got to pay our rent. She agreed that she'd dial down the translation a bit. I quit the toy making, laid off the two ladies who were acting as sales ladies. They weren't happy about that. And I said, that's it. From now on, I'll teach English to put food on the table, and I will go back to practicing printmaking. And I did. And we made a real deal with the whole family that don't bother Daddy on Mondays. Mondays will be printmaking day. He will not do anything else. He won't take the kids to the park on Monday. You have to wait for Tuesday to do that. Stuff like this. And it worked. By the year end of that one, I had finished this print. This is uh, one of the emperors of Japan. It's uh, Tenji, Tenji Tenno, the emperor of Japan. I didn't even know what it was, but a woman at the local library had recommended it to me, here, try this for your next practice routine. On the printmaking Mondays, I got through to the end of the year and finished it. And then something happened. We had a two-year winter break at the end of the year there, end of 1988. And I got really busy with no English classes, finish, 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 finish. And the day this was finished, I think it was January 6th or January 5th, I can't remember, somewhere around there, first week of January, I did some test printing on this, put it aside, went to bed. And when I woke up in the morning, our clock radio had misbehaved something. It was normally good music and stuff for our clock radio. And it was just droning, 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 droning. And it turned out that was actually music. During the night, the Showa Emperor, Emperor Hirohito, had died. And it was the end of the Showa era. And funny enough, my new print came to life just on literally the first day of the Heisei era. I move on a couple of days, the year-end holiday finishes, kids come back to the English class and we're all, what did you do over the New Year holidays? I did this, I did that. They asked me, what did you do over the holidays? And I said, I made this little print, you know, I finished this print. And in one of the adult classes, it's a class of four people, three of them said the same thing. They said, can I have one? Can I have one? People want my prints. This is where we're sort of going to tie things back. Remember, back in Canada, I had tried this. I'd tried to sell them at craft fairs, and I'd done this and that, and, and I had learned something important. Remember, I had learned that I liked making them and stuff like this, but I sure didn't like, you know, driving trucks around Canada trying to sell them here and there. But here we are now. People are pushing me. Can I have one? Can I have one? That's okay. You, you can't make a living giving prints to the students in your English classes. How could I do this? Could there be some way to make a living at this, maximize the making part, and minimize the selling part. And somewhere in there, I had the idea that I could do it by subscriptions. Now it comes the spreadsheet. What I'm thinking is this. You do the things in a set. If I made a set of 10 prints, for example, for 10 months throughout the year, I could spend one month doing exhibitions, one month back in the summer holidays, to 10 prints a year. People would sign up for the 10. They'd pay a monthly fee. If you could get enough people to do this, you'd have a regular monthly income. It might be actually a way to do this. And you wouldn't have to be selling stuff all the time. Do your selling at the exhibition in January. Talk to people. Do the media, whatever you have to do. Then go back to your little room and make prints from February to December. On paper, it seemed to add up. But, 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 this is a poet series, not of 10 people. There's a hundred people in this set. This is the Shakunin issue. A hundred prints. Okay, I said ten a year. That means ten years. So, I mean, give me a break. She just, she just, just laughed herself. Silly. Even I'm like, just, come on, Dave. Up to now, you played flute, got really good, you quit. You built guitars, got really good, wonderful guitars, you quit. You businessman, quit. You went to university, you quit. You cannot hang on to something for more than 15 minutes. You get really good at it, you get bored, and away it goes. Why would this time be any different? Can you do this? Well, can I do this? There I was, two kids. This changes things an awful lot. That keeps you, you know, busy at what you're doing when you're paying rent and there's two kids who, who need food and stuff. That's one part of it. 
Another part of it is I'm a bit older, I'm a bit more mature, so I said to myself. But what really pushed me over was a guy I met while I was trying to make my decision on this. I met him one morning, I was brushing my teeth. I met the man in the mirror. <laughs> and he said, he said, he looked me in the eyes and he said, you're chicken shit. You're just chicken. There's a big project here. Are you a man? Can you do this? Can you grab something? Or are you just going to try this, try this, try this all through the rest of your life? And once you put it to yourself in that form, if I answer yes, I'm a good guy. If I answer no, I'm a bad guy. Once you put it to yourself in that form, there's only one answer, isn't there? There's only one answer. So me and he had a little conversation. <laughs> and I came out for breakfast and said, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And she rolled her eyes, but to her credit, she cooperated. And what we did was this. We got that first print that Emperor Tendo. I sat in my little room, held it up with my little tools by my side. She took a picture. We took the photograph out to a reproduction center, had a bunch of copies made, and we borrowed a friend's little word processor. It's before computers and stuff. We borrowed a word processor. And there we are. And I can, this one's the Japanese version. We've got the English version as well. Canadian printmaker follows in Edo footsteps, working on a project that may be of interest to your readers, recreating a beautiful series of color woodblock prints more than two blah, 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 blah. Canadian woodblock printmaker Dave Ball. We went to the library. We found the addresses of some like uh, newspaper offices and TV offices, NHK, whatever. And the two of us, we had the address, put the stamps on, got them already, 20, 30, 40s, I don't remember where. But I do remember going to the post office. And there they are, all these media announcements. I'm at the post office. There's the slot. And there's the slot. And that's the point of no return. I can either go home. Of course, whatever. You put him in the slot. There's no going back at this point. And it didn't hit that night. It took a couple of weeks, but my God, they bit. They bit. Within days of this, it was like two or three days later, I'm reading my breakfast newspaper, the English Japan Times, they ran it. Just, they didn't even phone us, they just ran it. My photograph, my announcement, tenure project, contact David Bull, 04255525. The next one was the Tama a local, little, little local newspaper. The guy came out to say hello and to chat. The Yomiuri newspaper, the biggest newspaper in, in the biggest newspaper in the world I think at that time they ran a story picture there there's Dave doing this with his little beard the Mainichi newspaper is funny they phoned and they said we can't afford to send somebody out right now tell you what write your own story send it to us and we'll run it and I'm like okay <laughs> so I did I wrote the story I want to be a shokunin and they ran it in their newspaper a couple of people phoned up can we subscribe to the prints and then a big one one of the press agencies sent a team, a couple of photographers, a makeup lady and a reporter, and they did this and did that. And they took a picture and stuff, and they sent it out to different newspapers and magazines all over the country. We were up and running. Now, to tell the full story of that Yaknin issue, the 100 Ports Project, it'd be another full video. I mean, there's so many things happened, good times, bad times, incredible things happened. But here I can simply note, it did come out as planned, it finished exactly on time, on schedule, in December of 1998. And that's, that's, that wasn't so easy. Now, if you imagine 100 prints, if I'm one day late with each one, that's 100 prints, that's 100 days, that's three months late. I wasn't. I finished on time and on schedule after 10 years. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary time of my life. And as I said, we can, we can talk about that story some other time. This is about prep. This is supposed to be a story about my beginnings, so this is a good place to close this. Before signing off, though, there's one thing I do have to show you because it ties back to the beginning of this video. And I've got to show you, I've got to tell you about, it's a postcard I received in the autumn of 1993. It's as the 10-year project was approaching the halfway mark. By this time, I was producing and publishing. I did a quarterly newsletter in print, actually physically printing, you know, to a printing company. And this was going out to collectors of my work, to collectors of the prints, people in the media, and other people in the printmaking world. Now, because the halfway point of the project was approaching, I received a number of cards and letters from readers. And I put some of these in the newsletter on that issue. And among the letters I received, one came in from Adachi-san, who we met earlier in this talk. 
I don't have it here because I tried to find it and what I did is I keep my correspondence in nice files but I kept that one out to sort of look at it and it's somewhere. But I do know what it says because I put it in the newsletter. I called him up. He said, you have permission to use it in the newsletter. And here's an English translation of what he wrote. Thank you very much for sending the newsletters. I have great respect for your work and the efforts you are making to make people understand the background of woodblock printmaking and the traditional Japanese culture. You are actually doing what we should be doing, and we appreciate it very much. So it's ten years, ten years uh, to the month between him throwing me out of his workshop and sending that card. <laughs> Some things take time. So there we are. But can I can I do this again? Can I say one more thing? <laughs> A couple of months after receiving that postcard, I had the halfway exhibition. This was in January 1994. The show was spectacularly crowded. The media, TV, they'd been really, really good to me. And late one afternoon, just before we closed, the crowd was thinning out a bit, and a group of people came in the door. It was Adachi-san, together with all of his craftsmen. They looked around the prints on display and they came to me one by one and they made, you know, as you might expect, of course, the usual sort of polite comments on my work. You know, I was really, really pleased they'd taken the time and the trouble to come over and see me. They're getting ready to leave and one of them comes forward and he gives me something. I've, I've mocked this up so that you can see what it was. He had something round wrapped in aluminum foil, just like this. He gave it to me and I'm like, and actually, I can see what this is, and my eyes go like about this big. And I, can I open? I can take this case. Let's open it up. I open it up, and inside, it's a handmade printer's baron. Now, this man, one of Adachi's printers, he made barons on the side, and here he was giving me one. Now, this is a big. These are expensive. A normal, typical, average handmade baron is at least six, seven, eight hundred dollars, and some of them go up to like twelve hundred dollars, depending on how much weaving there is in there. It was a wonderful, wonderful gift. I was just staggered by the friendship and generosity. I don't know who paid for it. It wasn't in discussion, but there it was, a present from this man or these men. There was no chance for extended conversation. They were, he gave it to me. We said thank you a minute later, and then he's gone. That man was Kubota-san, Keiichi Kubota. Does that name sound familiar? It should do, because on every one of the prints, not every one, on many, many, many of our Ukiyo-e heroes prints, you can see it at the side, designed Jed Henry, carved David Bull, printed Kubota Kenichi of the Mokohankan workshop, Tokyo. That's enough. See you next time. Thank you again.